of one boat into another. This here, this is stepping out on water. This ain't your best sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. Thank you. The submission ain't submission till it feels like submission. That's right. This is the it's beauty true. of the basement. Love, it makes you feel like you just want to tell everything. Are we live? Yes. Yo! Welcome to the basement, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Tim Ross. And we are live, fam. We are doing our first YouTube live right now. This is this is happening right now. We we are live right now our first live show it, this is not pre-recorded this is completely live and in color and so i'm so glad that you're with us um and if you're not a person that uh watches us on youtube live and you're listening to this podcast thank you for listening uh this is probably going to be uh one of the most schizophrenic pods uh of the night because we're just going to be engaging with people in the chat and uh, I'm kind of hungry, so you might hear me like chewing uh, food because I have a grilled cheese that I got from Starbucks and I want to eat it. Um, this is going to be a different type of night. And so uh, I'm here for it. And we got people in the live chat that are here for it. And we're just going to be engaging and uh, connecting and uh, doing what we do down here in the basement. We're going to keep it spontaneous. We're going to keep it authentic. We're going to keep it live, and we're just going to be doing what we do. So um, without further ado, I am here with my peeps. I am here with Hector and Sam, and we up in the 90K? building. We hit 90K. Yeah. Woo! We hit 90K, people. Hey, shout out to all 90,000 subscribers on YouTube. This is like crazy. Here's what I want you to know. We were sitting at about 89,900 right like 40 minutes ago and um I jumped on IG live because IG live is where I originally started talk on Tuesday and um talk on Tuesday was basically like the basement but on IG live before I even knew that there was going to be a basement and that was in 2020 that I jumped on and started doing that and here it is two years later and we're sitting here with 90,000 subscribers, like 90,000 individual people took their finger and they clicked the subscribe button. And that's all happened in less than four months. They didn't just hit the subscribe button, bro. They're down in the basement. They are you down got 90K down in the basement. In the basement, man. This is crazy. Like, this is seriously crazy. And so, um, I just want to give a shout out to all 90,000 subscribers, wherever you're from, wherever you're watching or listening in the world. Um, we, we know you're a person like we're not just looking at that number and going, oh, look at the number. Like every number has a name. Every name has a story. Every story has a soul. Uh, and um, we, we are just so grateful that you are you are down and like rock with us like this. It doesn't it doesn't. Um, uh, it's not lost on us and I don't take it for granted. And so, uh, thank you. I love you. I'm so honored to serve and support, um, the basement dwellers. You know what I'm saying? Like this, this dweller nation is a real thing. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm just, I'm just so grateful for you. And so, uh, tonight, like I said, we're just going to tee up. It's just going to be like a kind of hot topic, you know, double Dutch, peppers you, you know q a type whatever we want to talk about we just going to talk about but and everybody in the chat you guys can fire questions away yep we know sometimes we see y'all in the comments of instagram and tiktok uh that's the grilled cheese if you hear that uh, yeah is eating i'm dinner. so sorry y'all <laughs> uh, if you have a question you want to ask we see them in the tiktok comments and ig please tonight is the night for that so let's get it Mm-hmm. So 
you probably should have kept talking right there because <laughs> I'm like chewing. So uh, this Thank was uh, this was really significant because in when you were doing talk on Tuesday, you were not even at 32k, right? Because this was two years ago, for real. And then today we're at 135 on IG, dude. Yep, and that's um, this is gonna be so like for people that have like weird, like cringy things with my mouth noises. This is going to murder them right now. Actually, I know a friend of mine. Um, her name is Destiny. She has a problem with, she has an issue with mouth noises. This is going to be brutal for her. She'll probably have to, like, skip this entire pod for the first, you know, 10 minutes or however long I'm eating. You know what I mean? Thank you so much, Rach. Rach is in the building today as well. Let's go. Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm, um, uh tonight is just like a freestyle right you know what i'm saying we'll just we'll just see what everybody wants to talk about um but like for real what we really felt like was um nothing has been wasted that's what we felt like tonight was all about like two years ago i'm doing talk on tuesday um with like a hundred people on the live and um you know, tonight I jump on the live just to holler at people and we get up to like 500. Um, uh, but when God, when God has called you to do something, um, whenever you get to wherever you think there is, what you're going to find is that nothing's been wasted. When David um, became king, uh, the Lord referred to him and all of the kings of Israel as shepherds which meant that his time in the field as a shepherd was not even wasted because God was training him with sheep to take care of people. Nothing has been wasted. And so, um, you know, Ruth is gleaning in the field. And before you know it, she's married to the owner of the field, which meant her time in the field had not been wasted Jesus comes to earth from heaven to die for our sins so that all of us that would believe in him would be back with him which means his blood was not wasted Ooh, I'm on a roll I can keep this going um I I just I just want you to know that wherever you are in your life right now whatever you're going through I don't care how slow it's going. I don't care how tough it is right now. This season of your life is not being wasted. You are literally being prepared for whatever God is calling you into. And um, don't despise this season. I remember back in 2020, I was so happy doing Talk on Tuesday. I was looking forward to it. I had energy in it. I had life behind it. I'm not bringing any more energy to this that we're doing right now with the basement than I was to Talk on Tuesday back in 2020. Because if, if, if the only time you do something is when there's a huge crowd, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Your motives, you, you wouldn't be trusted with a large audience depending on how you felt about the smaller audience. If you're faithful with the few, then he will make you a ruler over many. So I, I, I just need you to understand that... Um, uh, there's no part of your story, there's no part of your narrative, there's no part of your life that is being wasted. God God is doing something in and through you, and uh, he is the one that determines uh, the reach of that, the impact of that, the influence of that. And back in 2020, uh, when I was doing Talk on Tuesday, I thought, ooh, I'm reaching the world, literally. We were talking to people in Scotland, we were talking to people in Australia, we're talking to people all over America. I'm like, we doing it. I never saw this coming. Like, And if this never came, facts, let's talk about that. If this never came, if this influence never came, which we all recognize as God-given, if, if this status has never come, which we all recognize as God-given, we wouldn't have been tripping. We wouldn't have thought this was a failure because we're being obedient to what God told us to do. But I, I will tell you one thing, with more 
followers and influence. There is more criticism. There is more critique. There is more that people have to say. And so, um, you know, I think it would probably be good for us to talk about um, the, the blessing uh, of success, but also the stewardship that comes with success. Because when you get successful, everybody don't like it. And when you get successful, uh, more people have things to say and everything is not good. So we are now in that season where people are making videos about our videos. Like that's, that's going on right now. That's like, that's a thing. I didn't know that was a thing. That would never be a thing for me, but that's a thing for some people, right? They make videos about other people's videos. And um, uh, some of the things that people make video content about is pretty cool. And some of the things that people make video content about um is interesting like they don't they don't like they don't like the basement they don't like what i say they don't like how i say it they don't like um what i talk about they don't like the way i articulate what i talk about and so um this is a this is a space that i've been in for four months um and i realize that there are some people that don't have a lot of uh patience for you to be correct and and for you to have it all together and so any little mistake that you make, they jump on you. I'm just here to tell every single one of the people that don't like the basement, that don't like me, that think I'm a false prophet, that don't like what I have to say or think I'm prideful, I love you. I love you so much. And I'm so thankful for your voice. I'm thankful for your life. I'm thankful for the purposes and plans that God has placed in you and on you. Uh, I know that you have a love for God and that you want um, to ensure that the people of God hear the right things. And uh, for whatever reason, you don't think that I'm committed to the same thing. Um, we agree to disagree on that, but I just want you to know that I love you. I have no animosity against you. Um, I'm never going to attack you. I'm never going to um, clap back at you. Um, my Lord hasn't given me permission to do that. Um, that's not the way brothers and sisters in Christ should even engage with each other. And so um, I'm now to the point where I do see uh, more of your comments and I do get to see some of your clips and your postings of things that uh, you take issue with that I do. Um, and it's duly noted, um, in, in the places that I agree with you, I will definitely change. I'm not above correction. Uh, but for the places that I disagree and I'm on good ground to disagree, uh, I will just disagree with you, but I will also let you know that I do love you and I care for you deeply. And if I ever saw you in the street, I would give you the biggest hug that you've ever had in your entire life. So I guess I've just, uh, addressed my, um, my naysayers or whatever. Just want them to know that I love them. Well, I wanted to ask you, we've been a, we've been seeing a lot of new creators on YouTube making videos about the basement and you specifically, not even just the basement, but also some of your sermons. And the crazy part is some of these things go viral. Mm -hmm. Like people around the globe are watching a full on review and critique of Tim Ross and everything he's doing. So obviously you're a confident dude, you know who you are in the Lord, but now with you being in this new space, it's not face to face, it's online. How have you, how is your heart and your brain and how do you react to it? So y'all about to get like the worst a ASMR of all time. <laughs> I wish your comment was like two minutes longer. But y'all about to get this. Y'all about to get all these mouth noises and this smacking. I know I'm murdering Destiny right now. She is. She cannot be listening to this right now. She's probably terrified. Still chewing. I promise you. This is a live, y'all. I'm so sorry. I know you probably wish I was more professional. If you're listening to this, I know you're just creeped out. You got to be completely creeped out. But um, so to answer that question, heck, um, 
right? We're, we're, we're just under four months in, right? November 6th will be four months that we've been doing this. So we're still getting, I'm still getting used to it. Like I'm, I'm still getting used to being a content creator, quote unquote. I'm still getting used to being an influencer of some kind, quote unquote. So it's just really, it's all kind of new to me and it's all weird. Uh, it seems like a lot of these people that have these comments have been established for a while. And um, I guess I've popped up on their radar. Um, and and they they take issue with what I say, right? Or the way I say it or or whatever. Um I I I don't have this like kind of Jesus complex where it's like they hated Jesus, they're gonna hate me, right? Um uh I'm not gonna go that far, right? Cause because I, I actually think and if they because think about it, if they take the time to really like do a critique and to break down, they're actually passionate about the Bible. They're, they're passionate about God's word and they they want to defend it. They want to protect it. And somehow they, they think that I don't want to do the same. Uh, and, so, and so instead of reaching out for a conversation to get context or going back to the pod that they saw the 90 second clip of to get full context, it's, it, we're just going to get a full on review of why this dude is, maybe the worst guy out here to listen to and hey, everybody steer clear and they go viral, right? And tens of thousands of people are watching this person make a critique about me. Um, it's a free country, man. It's a free country. And um, uh, again, I, I'm not on Jesus's level, so so I'm not gonna talk about him, but a lot of people didn't like Paul. A lot of people had took issue with Peter um, in the book of Acts, you know, in Rome, in Galatia, in Corinth, um, they were calling Paul a straight up fake in Corinth. You know what I mean? And, um, what can you do? You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't play whack-a-mole and chase down everybody that doesn't agree. We got, we got, we got 90,000 people that do agree or they would unsubscribe. And I'm pretty sure I might say something at some point that I make them go, that's too much, Tim. Click and they might unsubscribe. So like I, I, I'm not out here for likes. I'm not out here to be liked. I'm actually out here because he told me to come out here. Like I would not be out here if God didn't tell me to come out here. So that's the only reason why I'm out here. And I'm going to stay out here. Whether they like it or not, I'm staying out here because I'm not scared of nobody. You know what I'm saying? So, so I just... I, I feel like I have the boldness of the Holy Spirit. I feel like I'm on good ground because God told me to do this. Um, uh, and as many people that don't like what we do, there's way more people that do. And so I'm focused on them. And I, I think that's a, let, let me just say to to all of you all that may be dealing with some criticism in your field, whatever you do, you could be a school teacher, you could be choir director you could be a pastor you could be a doctor and and you've you've taken a stand for christ and and you're you're bold about your faith you're not obnoxious but you're bold and some people don't like it like what you gonna do well the only thing you can do is love on them scripture says to love your enemies i don't think anybody that's coming against me is is somebody that i can actually classify as an enemy i don't know them to for them to be enemies I can't even call them haters because I do feel like they're really passionate about their position. The, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were very passionate about God. And they thought what they were doing to Jesus was in defense of God. They didn't know until later. And, and so I might be wrong. They might be wrong. We ain't going to find out till later. So, so I'm not going to judge them, you know, and I think we need to, I, I think we need to, um, I think that's just something that needs to be focused on because um, what I have to steward what, what this is, what God gave us. God gave us this basement as a forum uh, to mentor people and to disciple people and to give them a perspective. It's, it's my unique perspective and not everybody's going to agree with it but to give them a perspective based on my 47 years of living, my 26 years of being uh, in ministry and my 24 years of being in uh, uh, therapy and counseling. 
I give this to you freely. Do with it what you will, right? Um, uh, but at the same time, what we're not going to reduce this platform to is clickbait for arguments. Now, I'm going to say that right now. I bet you y'all got the wrong one. Y'all ain't going to have me up here arguing with Butterfly909, who has 120 followers. You know what I'm saying? And no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, this, I'm not about to start a shouting match. I'm going to invite somebody that got a beef with me on the show and start going at it with them. Yeah, and you said this, and you, well, you said that, but then you said this, but then you said that, and then you said that, and then you said that. <laughs> Man, please. <laughs> right. Yo. Yo, some of these people are on IG Live. And YouTube, and they're as toxic as the Call of Duty lobby. It's like some, it's like some thirty-seven-year-old dude who's four hundred and seventy-two pounds, who's mad that he got domed while he was parachuting into the map. He got shot out of the sky. So like, can't stand her. Beep, 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 beep. You stupid mother. Beep, beep, beep. Christians are acting like that right now. They're like going to war with each other. Dude, I survived L.A., fam. I survived Clip, C Crips, Blood, Essays, and Asian Gangs. And you think I gave my life to Jesus to argue with you? I had a gun pointed to my face, fam. This is real talk. Somebody literally pointed a nickel-plated Deuce 5 to my face and told me he was going to smoke me if I didn't tell him what set I claimed. And it just so happened my mama was praying on her knees the same time this dude had the gun to my face. So I'm not beefing with nobody in the kingdom because I survived real I survived real smoke, fam. This fake smoke out here. Tim's Tim's not in the Bible, and this guy is he's just a charismatic pimp. Just a He's just one of these false prophets that's spewing his hate. And how can anybody listen to him? He's just a comedian. He's not even, he doesn't take Christ seriously. All right, dude. Amen. Amen to you. God bless you. I don't take him seriously. I just gave my life to him and I died every day and I changed my whole life for him. But So okay. there's a, we're seeing in the chat, Lydia Maldonado. And I think this, this might go parallel with kind of what we're talking about. Um, Lydia Maldonado asked, what can you tell us about uh, enduring suffering and how is it biblical, whether that's loneliness, pain, walking in obedience, et cetera? I know what you just said was super profound because mm -hmm. it's, I have endured suffering. Mm -hmm. I have almost lost my life. Mm -hmm. I've gone through all of these things. So yeah. I'm at peace and I don't need to prove anything to you. Correct. So where, where do you think that mindset comes from, whether mm -hmm. it's in just Western culture, globally, where... We have keyboard warriors. And is, does that, is that a part of the not suffering? Or what, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, Noah or Nathan? Hey, baby. Can you, can you go to my um, car and get my uh, backpack? My Bible's in there. And to answer Lydia's question, I need my book. Um, I would have already had it out here, but I was hungry, so... <laughs> um, so, so first let's talk about the fact that the majority of people in American culture that are believers in Jesus Christ are not suffering at all. Secondly, let me say suffering is relative. A billionaire that you, that loses a lot of his wealth in the stock market is suffering. <laughs> a homeless person that winds up being the 101st person to the shelter when, they, when their capacity is 100 is also suffering. So suffering is absolutely relative. But when it comes to, thank you, my, thank you, my friend. Let me just unzip here. Shelter, stop by Emmanuel, and 
And hey, we want to shout out the 1,000, first time it's happened, <clears throat> 1,000 people in the live stream right now. Right now. Yo. As the Bible got into Tim's. <laughs> <laughs> That's what to, that's what took us over the top. He's reading the Bible. Grab. Gra yeah, he's got his Bible now. Now you can now you can uh, now you can watch him. All right. So Hebrews chapter number eleven, um, which is uh, thanks. Uh, Hebrews chapter number eleven, which is a very uh, pa a powerful chapter. Um, but there's a part in it that's like so slept on. That we don't get. So this is this Hebrews chapter number eleven is a great chapter on faith and it's all good. But but I want to I want to get to this part uh, towards the end because um, it gets real gangster. Okay, how, I'm starting at verse number thirty two. So oh man, let me take off my glasses. Uh, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the all the prophets. By faith. These people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. Without a break in the verse, listen to what happens next. But others were tortured. Refused to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with the sword. Some went around wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Get this. All these people earned a good reputation. Not the ones that just had victory. Even the people that suffered, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God has something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Let me read it again. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. You need as much faith when you are successful as you do when you are suffering. And God sees no difference based on the plight that you are in. So when you ask a question about suffering, let me be very, very clear. It takes faith to suffer and still give God praise. It takes faith to get a stage four cancer diagnosis and still rejoice in the God of your salvation. It takes faith to be walking through a divorce and still get up in the morning and have devotion and say, God, you are my salvation. It takes faith to uh, get fired from your job and you still not uh, go sell your body on a corner or justify why you should start selling drugs or, or, or cheating on your taxes. It takes faith. And we only preach faith for the success and we never teach people how to deal with suffering. Scripture said there are people that by faith were sawn in half, stoned to death by faith. Sometimes your faith will take you to the palace and sometimes your faith will take you to a prison. Sometimes your faith will take you to a mountaintop and sometimes your faith will take you to a valley. Sometimes your faith is going to take you right into the, uh, the CEO's C-suite. And sometimes your faith is going to take you to the unemployment line. Sometimes your faith is going to make you have the best life ever and sometimes your faith is going to make you have what people would consider the worst life ever i can do all things through christ that strengthens me i'm sitting here eating a grilled cheese in a very nice house okay um but i remember living in an apartment off east valley ranch parkway in irving texas eating wolf brand chili and rice out of tupperware bowls with my wife remember that baby wolf brand chili and rice you hear me fam and it was good 
and we would we would uh we would reduce that wolf brand chili and rice down in that pot, and I put a ten minute um bag of success rice uh inside a, a pot of boiling water, and um then we'd mix it up with some Louisiana hot sauce. That's what I used to put in mine, and I take half uh, a row of the saltine crackers and crush them up. And and so they were almost like fine dust, and I would mix it in there because that would make it even even more um, sticky and pasty. And I'd grub that thing up, uh, sitting on the couch watching watching a, a show with Juliet. I think back then we used to watch Impractical Jokers a lot. They weren't around back then. Oh, maybe that came later, much later. Oh, we were watching something that was funny. Oh, we used to watch a lot of comedians on uh, that's what it was on Comedy Central. We watched a lot of comedians on Comedy Central, like back to back to back. And those were our date nights. We didn't we couldn't afford no sea bass. We couldn't afford no 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 huh? Right? Cinnamon Toast Crunch cereal. We have our what we called our BOCs at the end of the night. Our bowl of cereal. So so um I can't even consider that suffering. That was just a stage of our life that that we were in. But when I look back on it, here's the thing. All this can go tomorrow. If what God's calling me to right now is not going to make as much money as I made in the past, what I'm going to do, not do it? And then blame God for it? I can't believe you got me out here suffering like this. It's a part of life, man. Everybody, everybody, everything you call suffering ain't suffering. It's just a season. Woo! I felt that thing. A lot of stuff that we call suffering is not suffering. It's a season. What you call suffering, God calls winter. Buy a coat. All right, so we got Brian Smith kind of just going with the flow of all of our comments and what we're talking about. We're really just being strategic with the questions we have. Brian Smith says, what do you do when you've blown it bad and don't see any way out of the situation? Can you give me some examples of people who blew it bad in the Bible? Abraham blew it bad. Oh, no. Adam blew it bad. He was first. Eve blew it bad. She was actually first. Mm -hmm. Eve blew it bad, then Adam blew it bad. Um... Abraham blew it bad. How can you say that about Abraham? He goes down to Egypt. He says that uh, Sarah, his wife, is his sister, which is deception more than it is a lie because that is his half-sister. Um, we can talk about how crazy that is later. Uh, <laughs> but that's his half-sister. Um, he deceives the king after the king has already paid him a dowry for Sarah. Abraham was paid in sheep, goats, and male and female servants. So when the king finds out, because God gives him a dream and speaks to him and says, That's don't touch that woman. That belongs to that, that woman belongs to um Abram. Uh the, the king goes, dude, what are you doing? You almost made me, you know, violate your wife. How come you didn't tell me that this was your wife? And he tells Abram and Sarai to go, but he doesn't take back the dowry. Doesn't take back anything he gave Abram. Do you know who was a part of that package deal? Hagar. Hagar would have never been an option for Abram if he didn't lie in Egypt. So Abram blew it. Isaac blew it. He was deceptive as well. Jacob blew it. He was the chief deceiver. So if you want to talk about blowing it, everybody in the Bible blew it except for Jesus. <laughs> what are we talking about? Right? Paul blew it. He had people murdered. Then was like, oops, my bad. I now believe what you believe. I think you blew it. Right? So um, uh, I'm using a little bit of um, sensitivity here. Uh I guess what I'm trying to understand through this question that Brian is at is then Brian. I think the question, what I'm trying to ascertain is um, what do you mean by blew it? And 
what did blowing it cost you? That would give me a lot of clarity. Because here's what happens. Sometimes people blow it and they feel like just because they repent it, everybody should forgive them. Like, no, I don't want to say it that way. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me say it a different way. It's not that everybody should forgive them. They think everybody should forget. And some people can't handle what you did. And you got to deal with the consequences of that. And you might have apologized sincerely and you might be sincerely sorry and you might be like, you know what? I've turned a new leaf. I'm not like that anymore. And they're like, cool. I'm glad you're not like that anymore. And I want a divorce. <laughs> what you going to do? You can't make them stay. Why? Well, Jesus forgave me. How come you can't? Well, no, I can't forgive you. I can't forget. Well, God can forget. He can throw, he can throw into the sea of forgetfulness and he'll make your sins as far as the east is from the west. Yeah, God can do that. <laughs> the way my memory is set up, <laughs> I might not be able to take it. So, so we have to define what blowing it really is. And this is the basement. And if Brian was here live, he would have to tell me. Right. Um, so so I don't I don't want you to expose anything you don't want to talk about. Um, but if you were to give us the gift of your vulnerability and let us know how you blew it, then I can I can kind of tell you, oh, based on that, here's what you can expect and blah, 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 because I've blown it a bunch of times. Um, and there's consequences for that. And just there's just different things that have different uh, price tags affixed to it when you talk about what you do, right? If somebody, if somebody's doping, um, uh, they they probably can't run in the Olympics anymore. Doesn't mean they can't run track anymore. They just can't run in the Olympics. So they might be able to do a world track meet, like in you know Cleveland, Ohio, or host a, a track meet that's being hosted in you know Spain but you ain't running for the Olympics no more right they might ban you for 10 years and then you can come back and be reinstated or something like that Russia still can't be represented in the Olympics because they were just doping every year they were like we will win something we must bring home gold somewhere I'm so sorry for my Russian accent please forgive me I love you guys all right, so maybe uh, I'm not speaking for Brian at all, uh, but kind of what I'm getting just from that phrase alone, I blew it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's such an, it's a very extreme phrase. And I think a lot of that is attached to shame. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed of everything I did. There is an extreme of, I don't know if I can come back from this. So um, maybe in your life, have you ever felt that or have you had to walk somebody through where they felt the extremism of, I blew it and I feel I'm full of shame and I don't think I can ever come back from this. Yeah, I've blown it. And I've thought the same thing. And God is faithful. He knows how to bring you back. But, uh, no, I don't want to say but. And you have to be open to how he brings you back. I think sometimes people want to be restored right back to where they were and based on how you blew it you might not get back there but you will get back right God's never done with you God's never done with you but you may not get get back to where you were in that same place um if you're a praise and worship leader at a church and you know you had sex with the alto section um they I'm pretty sure they'll forgive you right I'm pretty sure they'll forgive you, but you, you're not getting your job back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you had sex with the alto section, not <laughs> <laughs> the whole section, the whole section, the whole section. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, I don't want to make it um, sound like, oh no, because a lot of times we preach restoration and we forget that, um, uh, our sins have consequences. When David, when David had Uriah murdered and sinned with Bathsheba, God said, hey, you're going to keep the kingdom. And the sword is never going to leave your house. His kids were screwed, fam. One of, his, one of his kids raped his daughter, 
One of his sons raped his daughter. And then three of his sons tried to overthrow him in the kingdom. That's baddie, fam. That's not cool. So even though you kept your job, right, there were still consequences for that behavior, right? We had, we had uh, 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 Joshua Broom on here a, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, great, great pod, right? He, he's an um, ex-porn star who gave his life to Jesus. And uh, so he, he's, he, he preaches the gospel. And what do people do? They send him clips of his own porn flicks. One of the consequences of being in that industry is that that stuff never goes away. You are out there forever. You're going to be in somebody's phone forever. You're going to be on somebody's site forever, right? So that's a consequence. Now, is God still using him? Is God still getting glory from him? But there is some residue that hangs around. Right. If you if you if if Bernie Madoff gets out of prison and gives his life to Jesus and becomes the CFO of a company, or well, first of all, it's a joke. That's hilarious. Um, uh, but but if he did, they're going to be like Bernie Madoff, the dude that did the schemes. That's never going away from him. Does he have to live with that identity? No, he does not. Because he is made new in Christ Jesus. He has been restored, but he has to deal with the residue that came with his actions. So I think a lot of times we do people a disservice in church when we tell them that God's going to turn it around. He's going to make all things new and you're not going to have to deal with it anymore. And your past is never going to haunt you again, fam. Certain things you do. It might come back and get you. I'm just saying. So, and that's not, I can't believe you. you you're not, you're, you're, you're not preaching grace. No, yeah. There's consequences for our behavior. Point blank, period. So, I hope that helps. Can you speak to uh, the helplessness that someone might be feeling in that situation? And like, the, just the dread or like the feeling of wanting to give up? Mm -hmm. Man, y'all, I'm almost done with this, but I'm so sorry for all the mouth noises for this first, uh, man, 42 minutes already, for this first hour. I'm almost done with the grilled cheese, and you guys won't hear this for the rest of the thing, but thank you for bearing with me. Your boy's hungry. So for the people that are feeling down and out, it's a good feeling to have. I know you didn't expect me to say that. It's a real good feeling to have. I want you to have that feeling. I just don't want you to stay there. I want you to absolutely feel how bad it is to blow it. And I want you to use that as motivation to pick yourself up and go, I never want this feeling again as long as as I live. I never want to go through this again as long as I live. You need to taste it. You need to taste it. You need to know what it's like to like lose everything or to lose the position or to lose the love of your life or to disappoint somebody so bad that they can't even look you in the face, to, to blow it so miserably that you make a person's skin crawl. When you see that, you, that's either going to make you right or make you wrong. And that's when you find out what you're made of, okay? The prodigal son was face down in some mud, looking around, seeing pigs. And while he was that low, he thought to himself, if I was at my daddy's house, it wouldn't even be like this. The servants at my dad's house have a better life than I do right now. And you know what he said? I'm going home. Smelling like pig doo-doo. I'm going home. With mud caked in his hair and halfway down his neck, stuck to his clothes, in between his toes. I'm going home. You gonna take a shower first? No. I'm going home right now. Because my father loves me whether I smell like roses or whether I smell like pig feces. I'm going home. 
and you can always go home. God's always going to accept you. God's always going to receive you. There's always going to be a community of faith that's going to accept you. But I'm telling you, if you've been cancerous in a community, the right thing for that community to do is to expel you from the body. We don't talk a lot about excommunication, but excommunication is biblical. If you've gone through a process and you, you've refused to submit, the body will reject you. And the reason why it's important for the body to reject you is because it's meant to make you feel the disconnect that you have from God. And because God can't get to you and you won't let the Holy Spirit convict you of your sins, the best thing the community can do is to expel you from the body so that you can learn your lesson. I'll give you Bible. See what, the, see what a good grilled cheese would do? I can hardly believe the report. Oh, I'm so sorry. First Corinthians chapter number five. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. You got, it's got to be low when Paul is writing the Corinthian church and going, y'all are, y'all are so freaky. The pagans aren't even doing what you're doing right now. Y'all are, y'all are perved completely, right? Um, I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. You must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed, and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that sin, that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity of truth. So let me break that, this down, and I got to read you the rest of it, okay? 9 through 13. Paul finds out that there was a, a dude sleeping with his dad's wife, his stepmother. And he's like, this dude is ro roaming around the church. I've heard about it. I'm not even there. And y'all are there, and y'all know it, and y'all haven't done nothing with it. See, we can't do anything in a church body, in a church community, with information we don't know. But once we do know and we don't address it, then the blood is on us as well. And what Paul is saying is, if you don't kick this person out, you are going to, what you are telling the community by not confronting this man is that it's okay. And guess what's going to happen? More dudes are going to start sleeping with their dad's wives. If you don't cut this off right now, a little yeast will leaven the entire lump of dough. It don't take a bunch of yeast to flatten dough. A little bit uh, to make dough rise. A little bit of yeast will make the whole loaf of bread rise. So he's saying you must kick this dude out. If not, your silence is condoning his behavior. Ready? When I, when I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. This is where it's going to get potent. And I'm going to go off on this. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Let me read this part again. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. 
why are we still picketing gay parades? Please, please tell me what is we doing as I bite my last two pieces of grilled cheese sandwich. Why are we picketing gay parades, people, as believers? Why are we telling sinners who have never confessed Jesus Christ, you're going to hell? It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. They're outside. What are, what are sinners doing? Exactly what they were born to do, sin. Is your memory that short? Do you not remember that you were born in sin? <laughs> Are you shocked that they're sinning? They were born in sin. What do you, what do you expect them to do? Right? So it's not, my, it's, not respons it's not my responsibility to judge outsiders. It is my responsibility to judge people inside the house. If I know somebody's having sex inside of the church with their, with their stepmama and I don't say nothing, I'm as nasty as they are. Now let's slow bake this. If I know, if I know two heterosexuals are having sex and they're not married and I don't say nothing, I'm as flagrant as they are. If I know that two people in the church are homosexual and having sex with each other and I don't say nothing, I'm as flagrant as they are. And a lot of times we only confront the sin that's convenient. There's some praise and worship leaders that have not been confronted because they're really good at what they do. There's some preachers that have not been confronted because they're really good at what they can do. I know he got a baby on the side, but he can preach. You're as flagrant as he is. Your elders are flagrant. Your board is flagrant. Your whole church community is flagrant. If you will let this person walk around and sprinkle this yeast in the community, guess what's going to happen? The drummer's going to start having sex with somebody. That's not the, his or her wife. The usher's going to start having sex with somebody. That's not his or her wife. All kind of corruption is going to take place because you won't confront the sin and put it out of the community. I don't have a problem with somebody who fell into something. But can we please admit that there is a difference between falling into something and living a lifestyle. If you've been on a diet for 40 days and you slipped up and had a piece of cake, that's a fall. If you've had a cake for the last 40 days but saying you were on a diet, that's a lifestyle. Stop lying to us. You've been to nothing but cakes every day for 40 days. Stop lying. Right? So if there's, like, if you was on, like, a little streak, that's one thing. But don't, you can't do something every day and talk about, man, I just keep struggling with this. You ain't struggling. You like this. This is a lifestyle for you, fam. And if you don't admit that, you can't get no real help. Well, I want to celebrate real quick 1,200 people in the chat right now. Hey. Never happened. Salute. Oh, yo. So it's That's amazing. <laughs> I love y'all so much. I love um, y'all so much. We do have Haley Owens who says, can you speak to the other side of this when you were not the one who made the mess, but you have to help clean it up? Oh, absolutely. That's terrible. Yeah, when you're, when you're on the other side of the mess, um, it's a heart-wrenching feeling. There's a lot of disappointment. There's a lot of regret. Um, most people that have to help clean up the mess, uh, what they struggle with is how come I didn't see the signs? How can I, I, my discernment must be off. Uh, I, I should have known this. I should have seen this. But the truth of the matter is uh, most people that, um, uh, you know, that are living flagrant lives, they win the trust of the people um, that they hurt the most. Um, and when you trust somebody, you let your guard down, right? When a family member abuses somebody within the own family, right? Like say an uncle is, you know, violating a niece. Well, the reason why 
the the parents never knew is because that's my brother and my brother-in-law. If there was anybody I was looking out for, it was a stranger. I wouldn't think it would be somebody that I already know. Right? So um, uh, you, you got to give yourself loads of grace when, when, you're, when you're cleaning up a mess. And y- you can't hold yourself responsible. H- how are you supposed to know? They gained your trust. That's when most predators act after they've gained trust. Right? That, this is one of the like, genius of narcissists. Narcissists gain your trust. They make you fall in love with them, become endeared to them. And then they start manipulating you. They, 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 they weave you into an elaborate emotional web and then they strike. So you have to have uh, the wherewithal to know that, you know what? I have to give myself a lot of grace. I know I was around this person. Maybe I did see a couple of signs, but I never, there's no way I would have known it's this bad. Of course not. They're, they're a master manipulator. That's the only reason why they got away with it. So, um, for Haley, um, if, if, if you've walked through that, I'm so sorry uh, that you've walked through that. That's, um, nobody should have to. Um, uh, but if you're committed to um, the community that you've been a part of, um, you help to make it a safer place. One, one of the things I will say um, within church communities when, when there's a fall and when there's a falling out subsequent to that is um, – I've just seen too many elder boards and board of directors or whatever kind of government they have in place. They, they usually swing the pendulum to like the most ridiculous extremes on the other side. You know what I mean? So if a guy, um, let's just say uh, the pastor slept with a secretary, right? And so now all of a sudden it's like, don't put a guy and a girl in the same room. Beware of the penis and the vagina. They could touch. Babies may break forth. (laughs) When the truth of the matter is, there was something in this man that connected with something in this woman, and they wound up violating their boundaries and and all that kind of stuff. Don't punish the rest of the community because two people couldn't have any self-control. And there's been a lot of... I triggered some narrative with this um, couple... Whatever... Cause y'all y'all need to know I don't I don't know what they gonna post until they post it I, I be just as surprised as you when they put the stuff I be like oh snap that was ooh that's spicy that came in hot that had a little jalapeno on it you know what I mean but they get they get these great clips and they put them out and boom you know people listen to them and it, it, and some people resonate with it and some people are completely triggered by it um, but yeah you know somebody really thought that um, my my heart's cry for genuine, authentic uh, relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ was like a red alert danger for, uh, oh my God, um, h- how could you possibly uh, put men and women in the same in the same room together? And you know that basically they they were saying that men are powerful and women are weak, and I just I don't, I'm not around weak women, so I I can't relate. Um. Uh, I, 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 we, we need to have. Uh, in order for us to really heal fully, we, we need brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, if not, it gets really, really lopsided. So, um, I, I just really hope that uh, people, um, people keep that in mind, for what that's worth. So, going off of the uh, that cleaning up the mess, I know a lot of that's tied to. Uh, I was born into this, some sort of a family with multiple generational things that they have to deal with, things that if they were a victim to something. Uh, Myra asked, how did your sexual abuse affect your intimacy with your spouse? Yeah, so um, my sexual abuse um, affected my intimacy. Um, Really, the barrier wasn't between there wasn't a block between me and Juliet. Juliet and I um, are extremely compatible uh, sexually. We 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 fulfill each other, and um, I having sex with her is euphoric. It's dreamlike. I, I 
my fantasies are fulfilled in that woman. Um, so my, my, my block wasn't with her. My, my block was, was with me. Um, uh, my porn addiction was blocking me from intimacy with my wife. Um, uh, and so that's work I had to do. There's nothing Juliet had to do, right? That there's something I had to do to remove that block so that I could be intimate and connect on a deeper level. Um, now when it gets, when you get into all things sexual, there are so many layers and so many complexities and so many, so many nuances, but you're asking me specifically about me. So I'm telling you about me. My block was, um, uh, the, the, the process of removing, uh, my connection to porn so I can make a deeper connection with my wife. So I hope that. I hope that I, answer, that I answered that question. Yeah, and just to kind of go off that, uh, there was, I forgot where I saw it, but someone was asking, um, oh, I don't know how to say his name, Javkis or Javix, um, how did you overcome your struggle with pornography and how, how do you still maintain that today yeah. after so many years of you know, sobriety from that? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I, the, the, it's a great word to use, sobriety. Sobriety. Um, I have to see porn the same way that an alcoholic sees alcohol. Like, right? Like, if you were in AA for 15 years, then you know that you're one drink away from being an alcoholic again. And uh, if your addiction is pornography, you got to know that you're one image away from being a porn addict again. Right? Like, you cannot play yourself into thinking, ah, oh, this, this, this will be. And because we live in such a sexualized culture and sex kind of permeates everything, it's almost in the air. It almost has like a, an airborne type quality. It's like if you had, if you did chemical warfare and you used an airborne toxin, right? That's almost how sex is in the culture. It's almost just like in the air. Um, so you just got to be very, very diligent. And you have to put a lot of systems in place so that you don't put yourself in this situation in a scenario. But but what I what I realize is most people, most people pet their sin. They don't kill it. So we'll let that marinate. Most people do this with their sin. They're there. Oh, calm down, buddy. You know I can't. Don't bite me. Don't bite me. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, don't bite me. Just, just, uh. Siegfried and Roy thought those cats loved them. And those cats did. For, for a couple of, a couple of decades. Until that cat got tired. That, that cat was like, I'm sick of these fireworks. Sick of you bringing me out this cage. <laughs> now, I'm not making light of what happened to him because he wound up paralyzed and it was tragic and all that. Kind of, and it was during a live show. But that's a freaking tiger, fam. What did you think you were? What? That's a tiger, man. It's a tiger from the wild. Do you know what a tiger is? A tiger is a wild animal. You thought you tamed it. And that's what most people think they do with their sin. I got control of it. It don't have control of me. Fam, stop playing yourself. Stop playing yourself. Sin never stays where you put it. You put it over here, you wake up in the morning, it's over there. <laughs> you put it over here, wake up in the morning, it's over there. Sin never stays where you put it. And if you don't bite it, it will bite you back. Don't pet that thing. You better kill that. You got to kill that. You got to kill a conversation before you have an emotional affair. Kill the conversation. How you doing? I'm not doing nothing with you. <laughs> Ain't no, I'm fine, just chilling. How about you? Kill the conversation. Delete the number. Move around. Like You know what I'm saying? Like Why would I play myself like this? I'm not about to play myself and be like, oh, she probably don't need me need, need nothing by it. Let me, 
Let me hit her back in the DMs. Well, well, what you doing? No, no, I'm just chilling. I'm just bored over here. Send me a pic. Oh, you know I can't be doing that. I don't understand what the big idea is. You scared? Send me a pic. No, I shouldn't really be doing it. Uh, see, you a punk. I ain't no punk. Well, if you ain't no punk, send me a picture. Well, I can, hey, I'm giving you real, real life scenarios, fam. I ain't even making this up. I talked, I talked to these people in my counseling chair who are on the other side of being stupid because they couldn't, they couldn't confess their sin. So stop playing with it, fam. I ain't talking from no theory. I've played with my sin. It bit me. And I'm like, you know what? You got to die. I'm, you're not going to be biting me off. You ain't going to have me out here embarrassed. I've lost jobs behind porn. That's how, that's how bad the addiction was for me. I lost some jobs. You know how embarrassing that is? I'm like, no, I'm going to have to kill you, fam. That thing didn't go down without a fight, though. <laughs> That thing did not go down without a fight. This thing was ugly. So you got to kill it, man. Don't pet it. Because anything you pet will overpower you. Yeah, so. Uh, going off of uh, kind of left field question on Monty's. What is your advice to single mothers who have made mistakes and trying to see their value when everyone is saying single mothers have no value? That's just not true. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm so sorry. It's just heartbreaking to even hear that. Like that's like telling a single mom she has no value is the equivalent to the Pharisees bringing the woman caught in adultery to Jesus. Was she having sex with herself? I'll wait. Was the woman caught in adultery having sex with herself? The answer's no. Where's the man? Y'all brought the woman, you didn't bring the man? Of course Jesus wasn't going to condemn her. It wasn't even a fair trial. You didn't even bring both parties. So in the same way, to look at a single mother and tell her you failed, where's the man? Where's the daddy? You know how easy it is to get caught up with the wrong person? Your heart loves who it loves. Sometimes it, sometimes your heart gravitates to a thug. You didn't even know it until it was too late. <laughs> didn't we have Jeanette on here a few weeks back? She was with a freaking serial killer and didn't know it. Your heart loves who it loves, man. You don't find out till later. Man, that was a bad choice. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you don't find out till after you eat the food. Man, uh, my stomach feels a little queasy. <laughs> I know something smelled a little off, but I was so hungry I ate it anyway, and then you wind up with food poisoning in the hospital for 24 hours, right? So so I, I, just, I just want us to, first of all, who was this again? Montez? Montez? Montez, I love you. You are so valuable. I'm going to look right in this camera. Montez, I love you. You are so valuable. And no matter what people have said about you or how they've tried to make you feel about your decisions, you have, you have a beautiful child or you have beautiful children. And there's redemption for you. There's redemption uh, for your story. Uh, there's a blessing and, and a purpose and, and a plan that God has for those children. You just hold your head up, girl. Um, because you're not the first person that has done this, um, you won't be the last. And uh, if you can uh, take control of your life and allow God and yourself, you got to give yourself permission, then allow God to rewrite your narrative. I, I believe God can do something incredibly beautiful with your story uh, that is so wild and so amazing that um, maybe five years from now, uh, you'll be telling your testimony and people won't even believe you. You'll be married again uh, or, or married for the first time. And um, 
uh, you'll be telling your testimony and they'll be going, wait a minute. Your husband, yeah, yeah, we've been married for two years, but but your kids are like 14, 12, and 9. Yeah. He got with you even though you had three babies? Yeah. Doesn't the Lord do all things well? Why would how many kids stop me from falling in love with the the guy of my dreams that the Lord sent me? So I believe God can rewrite any narrative, and, and for anybody that doesn't, um, they can kick rocks in Jesus' name. That makes it all sound spiritual if I say. If I put it in Jesus' name, then it sounds spiritual. Well, we got everyone in the chat saying amen, and mm -hmm. Monty says thank you so much. I love you. I love amen. you, Monty. Yeah. Um, Jason is asking, if we're in therapy, but our spouse needs it even more, how do you navigate encouraging them to engage in therapy slash counseling without offending or pressuring them? Um, therapy is not about them. It's about you. Do your work. The fact that you even stated that your spouse needs it more lets me know you haven't done enough work. Because when you start really digging into your own soul, you you stop thinking about everybody else. So I get the frustration that you may have that you're starting to do work and they're not doing work and you see a lot of blemishes in them. But this is about you right now, fam. Work on you. God can deal with them. Work on you. And when they see you getting better, it might inspire them to get better. It's like it's like you going on a diet and you lost seven pounds and you like looking at your spouse like, how come you ain't losing no weight? Finish your diet first before you start talking. And then by the time you finish your diet, based on the way you look and feel, it will be more compassion than it will be judgmentalism. It will be more compassion than it is critique. And then you can be a, a supporter and an encourager as opposed to someone that's judging. Now, we're getting into my mentorship tone, so I, I, I apologize if it got a little spicy right there, but... But when it comes to counseling, man, work on you. Don't worry about her. She ain't your issue right now. You're your issue right now. And I promise you, when you dig down deep in you, you don't come out looking judgmental at your spouse. You come out looking with a lot of compassion like, I understand where you are. I know why you're scared to do this work because it hurts. I know for a fact I've gone through it. You, you know what I mean? So um, don't worry about you right now. There was a meme I think it started as a vine. Where's she? She's, 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 oh, she's on the phone. Um, but there's a little, this, uh, <laughs> there's a little baby that's in a little car seat. And I think the dad turns around and was like, uh, hey, are you going to put on your seatbelt? And the little baby said, worry about your own self. <laughs> it's the cutest thing up in the whole world. Worry about your own self. And, that's what I, you, you know, if you're married and you're going to counseling, your spouse is not going to counseling, worry about your own self. It's the best thing you can do. So this is, uh, and I know both male and female can struggle with pornography. Yeah, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Any sort of addiction. Oh, absolutely. So my question would be, if you're the one not in addiction, mm-hmm. And this is just a question I have. This yeah. is the heck of a question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If, <laughs> if, if, there's, if there's someone in the relationship that isn't struggling with the addiction and the other one is, what is your practical advice and thoughts on how they should navigate in that seat where their plate is clean on that, but the other one is still living in that addiction and not sober? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a lot of uh, empathy, a lot of compassion. Um, a lot of support and a lot of boundaries, right? Don't make their issue your issue. Encourage them to do their work, but also stay in your own hula hoop. You're not the co-counselor. You're not the co-coach, right? Don't, don't try to, don't police them, right? Let them do their work. Encourage, support them to do their work. Keep going, honey, you're doing great. But don't also try to be like, hey, so uh, you all right? Don't you're gonna be you're gonna get pissed when they go, nope. You know what I mean? I'm thinking about it right now, or I just did it ten minutes ago, or whatever, right? 
So, so, so keep in mind that your assignment uh, as the spouse of somebody that's navigating that is to be supportive, uh, but is to be, here's a word that we use in therapy a lot. You need to be self-differentiated. You need to, you need to differentiate yourself from that other person and understand they are doing some work. I am here to support them, but I am not here to do the work for them. Right? If Juliet is running a is, is running a marathon, I can show up to like the water stations so that when she comes by, I have the little cup out, right? And then I get in my car and drive to the other little station cuz I ain't running the race, so I ain't running with her. Right, so I get in my car and go to the other station. And when she's running up, I'm like, "Here you go, baby. Here, take some water. Take some water." She comes by and she grabs it. And I always hate it in those little cups because you grab the cup and half the water spills out, and then like you just toss it in your mouth, and the other half goes on your cheek, and on you, so you only get a swallow anyway. <laughs> right? And then I drive to the next station. Um, I'm supporting her in the race. I can't run the race for her. Right. So so support and help are two different things. And a lot of times the, the 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 spouse of the addict thinks they're being supportive, but they're actually trying to help them do it. And that's not going to be achievable and everybody's going to wind up frustrated. OK, Sierra says a uh, follow up to Hector's question. What if they aren't doing the work? Then it's time for you to put them on a time limit. This is another part of being self-differentiated. I have a I have a real clean boundary right here. Hey, I'm willing to stay with you if you do the work. If you do not do the work, I won't be here. It's not an ultimatum. It's not even a threat. It's the reality of our situation. The only reason why Juliet is with me and we're about to celebrate 24 years of marriage in May is because I've done my work. Fact check. Big facts. Okay? Say a louder for the people. Big facts. If I did not do my work, where would you be, baby? Out the door. She would be out the door. She made that very, very clear. Okay? And um, uh, so, so I did my work. And because I did my work, our marriage works. But if I didn't do my work, and then maintain the work that was done. Hello, somebody, right? If you see recovering from any type of trauma as a goal and not a, not a journey, you're setting yourself up for, for failure. So I didn't go to counseling until I got over an addiction and then I don't go to counseling no more. I've been in counseling for 24 years, fam. That's why I can be out here in these streets talking to y'all like this. You know how many people are like, like squinting their eyes? He gonna fall. He be talking too much like, like, like he don't, he ain't gonna do nothing. He, he gonna fall like the rest of them. I'm not. And I'm not gonna do it because I'm not capable of falling. I'm not gonna do it because I am not going to come out of my system. I have a system that keeps me safe. I don't trust myself. In my heart dwelleth no good thing, right? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't even know my own heart, but I know my system. And my system is secure. And if I ever started to go outside my system, it would be so evident so fast that my entire accountability and community would swoop in on me. What you doing? What you doing? You, you have broken the pattern. You usually don't do this. What you doing? Stop lying. You know what I'm saying? And so he, here's, here's what I found out. I have found out that a lot of people don't like to uh, address certain sinful behavior because they want to give themselves an out lest they fall into it. Yeah, let's talk about this one. They won't go hard in the paint against certain sins because they're like, just in case I fall into it, I don't want it to be on record that I was going hard against it. That way, if I'm like light on it, people will be light on me if I fall into it. I gave people grace so they'll give me grace. Mm. 
That's how that's how complacency and corruption creeps into the church, into the heart, into leaders, is because they won't call a sin a sin. Lust has been a sin. Uh before I was born, it'll be a sin after I die. I have been a I have been uh 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 because I was sexually abused at, at such a young age and sexualized at such a young age. That was my struggle. When I gave my life to Jesus, I agree with the Bible about what it says about lust. <laughs> even when I couldn't have the, even when I didn't have the strength to live up to what scripture was telling me, the Bible was still right. The Bible's going to always be right, even if I'm wrong. I'll preach against sin, even if I'm in it. <laughs> and then turn around and have to preach to myself. Right? But this whole like deal of like, oh, I ain't going to bring that up because you know what I'm saying? Hey, if it wasn't for the grace of God, it could be me. Well, get a better system, fam. Stop flirting with sin. Stop being Siegfried and Royd out here. So. Going with the uh, corruption, um, there's a question that's asking if you can talk about the difference between honoring your parents and exposing abuse. Oh, God. Um, I kind of want to tie that in with someone else who's asking about breaking generational curses mm -hmm. and spiritual warfare. Yep. Um, because I feel like they can go hand in hand in this one, and it's it's a heartbreaking question. Very heartbreaking. So so let's deal with the first one: honoring your parents and how did they phrase it? And uh, exposing abuse. All right. So honoring your pay, honoring your parents and exposing their abuse. I'm making an assumption here. The assumption I'm making is the person that has abused them is also their parent. I'm making an assumption, and if it changes in the chat, let me know. But if that's the case, uh, you can't honor a parent that has not honored you. You cannot honor a parent that has not honored you. You ready for 1B? That was 1A. You cannot be dishonest at the sake of honoring. There is no honor for a person that did not honor you. And if a parent has physically, sexually, emotionally abused you, this is a dishonorable person. And the greatest gift you can give yourself is to be honest about the experience you have had with this dishonorable person. They want to know what if they're in ministry. Let's just let this marinate for a minute because I, I can tell this has made you emotional. It's super heartbreaking. It's super heartbreaking. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why I was supposed to read 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Paul writes, there is a person among you that is sleeping with his stepmother and y'all know about it and you haven't done anything about it. Paul says, I'm not even there and I've already judged it. In the same way, if it is your parent that has done this to you, they are already dishonorable. If they are in ministry, they are already disqualified. And you speaking your truth is not destroying their ministry. It's destroying their behavior and putting it to an end. And I'm praying that the same Holy Spirit that gives us the power to proclaim that Jesus is Lord would be the same Holy Spirit that gives us the power to expose sin, even with even when it's in 
the existing family structure. Blow it up. You're going to need a lot of support to do this. You're going to need a lot of spiritual backing to do this. You're going to, this changes everybody's lives, but they've already changed yours. So I bind the spirit of the enemy that would try to make silence be noble. For the sake of all the people, I don't want the people to be hurt. Free yourself. Your father didn't care that if you got hurt. Don't get me started. <laughs> A little leaven leavens the whole lump. If that doesn't get exposed, it goes to the next generation. And if he was brave enough, not brave, brazen enough to do this with you, it probably doesn't stop with you. Somebody has to go first. 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 Bless you, baby. And I, that's a complex situation that's going on. But we got to, we, we, sometimes it takes bravery. It takes one brave person to break the silence. It takes one break, brave person to break the silence. And that someone, that someone may be you. You're going to need a lot of support. You're going to need therapy. You're going to need a community. But I, I, I put an end to that. I don't care what, I don't, uh, but it's ministry and our name and no, 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 no. You violated my body. I came out of your body. And you have the nerve to violate mine. If he keeps going, it's because you, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't stop it. No pressure. I, this is a painful complex situation but those type of people have to be stopped and it takes somebody brave to stop it it takes somebody really brave to stop it and if you had the power to put this in this chat you got the power to put this into your own narrative and see the end of this pain yeah Ooh. Mm -hmm. I, let, I, I got a, what's the screen name? Uh, Lizzie White. Father God, right now in Jesus' name, um, I pray for Lizzie. I pray that you would uh, cover her. God, um, I can't imagine how emotionally devastating it has been for her to be violated by her own parents. But I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would give her peace and that you would surround her with a community that empowers her to speak the truth of her experience and that the sickness in her father would be brought to an end, not because she's exposing him, but because she's speaking the truth. May healing come to both of them when she speaks the truth about her situation. In Jesus' name, amen. <sighs> Boy, that's heavy. That pisses me off in ways that I cannot even possibly imagine. Dang, because we got guns over here. I need I need the Holy Ghost. When I hear stuff like this, I need the Holy Ghost. Cause this makes me want to take my three hundred blackout and put some sub subsonic bullets on it with a silencer and just just give me an address. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I'm gonna be I'll be spiritual again in a couple of minutes, but I just want to acknowledge my anger right now. Lizzie, I want to acknowledge anger for you. I want to, you should be angry. You have literally 
suppressed this and repressed this and, and been in silence. But there's a lot of anger that I feel on your behalf. And maybe you haven't been able to express that anger because when you're in this type of situation, you, you've, this is your family, so you've had to survive. I don't know when this, if this started when you were a real young girl, but, but how, where were you going to go? It's not like she can move. You know what I'm saying? So you've had to survive in this very abusive, very um, destructive um, uh, ecosystem. And um, I'm angry for you. I'm angry with you. Um, I'm heartbroken. And there's a lot of tears being shed right now. Um, I'm sure tears will come to me at some point. But right now, I feel so much anger for you. Um, and it's a righteous indignation that I feel because I want to, I want justice to be done. And I know I just talked about 300 blackouts and all this stuff. And obviously, I'm not going to act on any of that because that would be premeditated murder. I know the law. Uh, but I just want to say I, I do feel violent on your behalf because this never should have happened to you. You did not ask for this. You did not deserve this. There is nothing that you did to deserve this. I don't care how your body has developed. It never was meant for your father to violate you. I don't care what you had on in that house. You are his daughter. He should have never looked at you in a sexual way. Little girls are supposed to be safe with their daddies. Their bodies are supposed to be safe with their daddies. Your, your body was not safe with your father. And that makes me angry. And I want all the spiritual healing and restoration for him. And I want him in prison. Let's be, let me be quite clear. I don't want this swept under the rug like a Catholic priest who gets to move on to another diocese or gets sent to the mission field. I want him restored. I want him freed and delivered from this perversion. And I want this fool in prison. What if he repents? I want this fool in prison. I am censoring myself right now. Lord Jesus, help me. I do not want to embarrass my, myself when we hit 90,000 people. So help me, Holy Ghost. All right. Going on the... Um the avenue of, of parents, it seems a lot like it's it's a big thing in the chat. Um, a lot of the comments were saying, I've been waiting for this conversation to happen. Um, and maybe to go off of it, uh, Morgan asked, do you call someone that you forgave and tell them or just tell God that you forgive them? For example, like an absent father or an absent mother. Uh, do, do you call the absent father or mother? Yeah, I, I assume that's what they're asking. Do you uh, confront them and let them know that you have forgiven them? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If you if you if you have the opportunity to confront the person that hurt you, do it. And confrontation doesn't mean combativeness, argument, contention. Confront literally means to face forward. Let's face forward in the same direction on whatever we're we're talking about. And so um, if you had an absentee mom or absentee dad, um, talk to him about it. My mom, who is basically the Pentecostal version of Claire Huxtable, right? my dad is, my mom and dad are, are the Holy Ghost field Cliff and Claire Huxtable. They are, I won the lottery with my parents. But my mom a couple of years ago said, baby, um, is there anything that I did to you growing up that, that hurt you, I'm older now, and I just wanna make sure, I try to do the best I can, but I realized that I could have done some things that were better, or maybe I didn't do some stuff, and I could not believe, I had worked through this with my therapist, and I never thought I was gonna be able to talk to my mom about it, and she just handed me, a, she just handed me an alley-oop. She was like, baby, you, anything? And I said, yeah, mom. I said, you never came to my games. You never came to my talent shows in high school. 
And that always broke my heart. I'm, I'm like 45 years old when we had this conversation. Not 15, you know what I'm saying? I remember feeling like that, but it wasn't until I was older. I was like, well, how come my mama never came? Was she that saved? Like, you couldn't even come to a game? And she said, oh, my God, baby, I'm so sorry. She said, you know, daddy worked nights the whole t for 33 years, and I worked days. And so when I came home, the agreement we made was since he works nights, he sleeps during the day. And so in the evenings, he would take you to your talent shows and your, and your games. And I would come home and just get dinner ready and then get the learning center ready because we had devotion every night. We had a thing called learning center. I was basically publicly, privately homeschooled. <laughs> like my mom sent us to school and then came home and was like, hey, what did you learn? All right, let me tell you the truth. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of dope like that. But once she told me, once I had context, I was like, oh, y'all were two working parents doing the best you could to raise your kids. And you were like, okay, I'm going to cover this while you do that. And once I heard that, I was like, oh, I'm good. But I got to tell her. Right? Now, be warned. Because um, we really, Gen X is like the first, the, the, the first uh, uh, we're the first ones to get counseled. Right? It goes Gen X, Millennials, Zs. We're the ones that kind of, the, the, the scales fell from our eyes and we're like, we're not okay. Everything our parents said is not the truth, right? And so, I mean, right? You're growing up, you're like, my mommy and my daddy's head, right? You know what I'm saying? And so you, you grow up and you're like, you know what? Everything my mama did wasn't healthy. Or everything my dad did or said wasn't healthy. And then I, I kind of got to deal with that. And maybe I need to go see a therapist. And so um, then you find out, oh, man, my parents... Again, when you start doing your own work, you have loads of empathy for your parents because you're like, man, they did the best they could. And they didn't do, they didn't do, they dropped the ball in some areas. So, so be warned that you may have gone to counseling or you might be a little bit better and now you want to confront your parents. Just be cautious and be aware and, and be gentle. Um, because baby boomers did the best they could. Right? And let's not forget who baby boomers are the children of. They're the children of a generation that was literally called the silent generation. I don't know if y'all knew that. Silent generation gave birth to boomers. Boomers gave birth to both Gen X and some millennials. Because some of those boomers didn't have babies until later or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Or they remarried and had babies or whatever they did, right? So, and then uh, uh, Gen X has given birth to Zs and Alphas, right? Well, Gen X and Millennials have given birth to Zs and Alphas. That's as far as we are right now. So that's what, six generations? Silent, Baby, X, Mills, Zs, Alphas. So, so we're alive during a time where six gen, where there's six generations. So, so there's still some people that are born like you know twenties, thirties, early forties are still alive, right? And 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 their parents, I don't even know what their parents. I don't even know what <laughs> I don't even know who the silent generation's parents were. Like the ghost, I don't know the ghost generation. I don't know who these people. Are. But that's late eighteen hundreds going into the nineteen hundreds, man. So, so there's been an evolution over these generations. And every generation gets progressively a little bit better. And so my kids are, you know, they grew up in a much more communicative home than even I grew up in. And I grew up in a very communicative home. Um, and they hear all this stuff, right? Like my, we don't tell our kids, go hide. I'm talking about the fact that I was abused when I was growing. They know all this and they're 14 and 12. And the little issues that they deal with, we process it together as a family. So, so we... Like, we progressively get better, but we have to have a lot of empathy for those that came before us. They did the best they could. So I'm just saying, be cautious when you confront them because they, they didn't have, counseling wasn't a thing for them. They were told to suck it up. You got to remember that, that for baby boomers, um, uh, um, going to a, a psych, psychiatrist, you were going to a shrink. You were going to a quack. There was a negative, derogatory 
slant on working on yourself and doing your own soul care. Now it's in vogue. Everybody, Jesus in therapy. You know what I'm saying? Now everybody wants to have a counselor. Everybody wants to, mental health. I mean, everybody's into their mental health. I'm taking a break. I'm working on my mental health. Bravo. If baby boomers would have done that, they would have been ostracized from the community. At, at, he's not tough enough. He's a, he's a quack. And, you know, so, so we got to, if you're going to confront them, just be, be very, very kind. Um, there's a way to tell the, to speak the truth in love. And so just keep that in mind. And remember, they are your parents. So honor your parents uh, that your days may be long on the earth unless they were dishonorable to you and then have them prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Because I'm still mad. In Jesus' name. Jeanette from Los Angeles, your beautiful family member yeah. that we interviewed. Janacita. Yes. She asked... Um, how to know if God is pleased with your progress while he has you in isolation? Hmm. How do you know when God, if God is pleased with your progress when you're in isolation? It's a real familiar passage of scripture, but I'm just going to read it anyway. Uh-uh-uh. So, Psalm 23 says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. This is NLT. I know it's messing with people that are King James. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. So where is Jesus? Where is God when you're isolated? Very close beside you. How do you know he's pleased with you? Because he will never leave your son. If I ascend, okay, let's go to another one. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, Y'all really going to stop saying I don't read my Bible. Y'all going to have to come up with something else. Y'all going to get me on something because I don't, I don't have it all together. Y'all going to get me on something, but it ain't going to be this. Y'all going to y'all gonna have to, y'all going to have to come with something else. Um, uh, Psalm 139, starting at the, starting at the seventh verse. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Oh, Genesita, I hope this brings you comfort. Isolation isn't a bad place to be, especially when God's with you. The biggest misconception is that when you're isolated, he's not with you. And if he's not with you, he can't be pleased. But when God stops talking, he's letting his presence do the talking for him. My kids feel safe with just my presence in the house. They don't have to hear me talking. All they know is daddy is home. So when you're going through seasons of isolation, please be reminded, even if you got to like, these scriptures come to me instantaneously because I've gone through seasons of isolation where the enemies tried to make me feel like God's not pleased with you. You are out here by yourself. And I'm like, when he's not talking, he's present. My dad's home. He's just quiet right now, but he's with me. And I got scripture to back it up. 
There's no place I can go that he won't be with me. There's, I cannot go too high. This is why I'm not afraid of, this is why I'm not afraid of success because I can't go high enough that he won't be with me. This is why I'm not afraid of failure. I can't go low enough that he won't be with me. <laughs> I'm not afraid of getting a lot of money. I can't accumulate enough wealth that he won't be present with me. I'm not afraid of going broke either because my God is my provider and I'm never going to be lacking because I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I got a scripture for all of it. So what we, gotta, what we have to have is this book. Whenever the enemy tries to make us think that God's not with us, mm -hmm. we just have to go back to scripture because our daddy sounds like what he wrote. And what we read is the truth about him. So one of the times I was going through a really hard season and I felt like uh, I was praying and God just wasn't saying anything. And I went to a friend and he took me to Genesis and he brought just a very interesting perspective. And I thought it maybe would encourage some people in chat tonight. Um, God spoke in existence, the universe and everything in it. But when he made man, it said that he formed him. And so he just brought the perspective of if you don't hear God saying anything, usually that's when he's got his hands inside of you mm. and he's forming you mm. and he's forming something new mm. and he's not talking. He's, he's there with you. Yep. That's, that's a blessing, Sammy. Yeah. So he may be forming you, Genesita. He may be forming a lot of people in the chat right now, right? He's forming you. And don't let the isolation make you think that he's ignoring you. He's not ignoring you. He's in forming you. That was a bar right there. <laughs> All right, Tim, this yeah. is a, this, I'm going to start off with an encouragement for me and the dwellers in the chat. And then a question. Yeah. The encouragement from me, Sam, my wife, and the dwellers in the chat right now is that you have gone through this season. You're still in it right now. Mm -hmm. You've gone through it so well. And I've never been a part of something like this where I feel moved every day to jump out of my bed. Mm. And I'm... <laughs> We, bro, me in the chat, my wife, my legacy, S Sam's future kids, the dwellers' kids, everyone, we are so thankful for your obedience and we love you so much. And the only reason I bring that up is um, now that we've gotten into this spotlight, I've had, it's almost comedic, we've had people like message me directly and it's not a, hey, hi, how are you? It's, hey, I see what you're doing with Tim. I want all that. It's 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 like how can you make me famous too? Oh. And the encouragement is I don't even I don't even look at it. <laughs> <laughs> the encouragement from me in the chat to you is I am so grateful to know that you are never ever going to be that guy. You never have been and I feel like that's why this season is so flourishing for you. So my question is just going into 2023, um, where's your head and your heart space? Um, well, first of all, thank you. I mean, <laughs> uh, I love you so much. I love you, Rachel. I love you, Sammy. I love you, Juice. Um, I love all the basement dwellers I had no idea all of y'all were in me when the Lord gave me the vision for this I could have never have anticipated this like ever in a million years 
Let's go. So it's just, uh, I really do appreciate the love and support and uh, I don't take it for granted. Um, I don't, I, I literally don't know what, um, I, I don't know, I really don't know what 23 holds. Um, we're going to take some time off. Um, uh, you know, after uh, my season ends as a lead pastor on, on December 31st, like, just take some time off to like chill out like uh travel the world and hang out with my family and chill <laughs> and uh you know probably around like really second quarter maybe April May June Juliet, we're just going to take that time to just pray about, like, okay, Lord, what is this season of our life supposed to look like? Like, am I just supposed to do a podcast? <laughs> um, And if that's all he wants me to do, literally, I will, I'll just do that. You know what I mean? Um. Yeah, that I, you know, I, you know, I feel, I feel like I'm supposed to say this now. I, I, I think I talked to y'all that I, about it. I felt like I was saying like at the end of the year or the beginning of next year. Um, but like we're stepping into this um new season, and I've had a lot of people say, um, can you tell me how to give to the ministry because you know, we're going to start tithing to you. Um, and that's so, it's, it's so humbling. Um, and, um, it's so unscriptural. So sorry. You can't tithe to me. I'm no longer going to be a pastor anymore. I'm no longer leading the church. Scripture is very clear about where the tithe goes. The tithe goes to the to the church. And so um, I know you guys are trying to express love and show love, and I'm, I'm glad you feel connected to me. But please keep the tithe in the local church. That's where I'm keeping my tithe, keeping it in the local church. Um, and what I've been praying about, and I, I felt like the Holy Spirit Gave me permission to do it now. That's why I was kind of pausing because I'm like, it's the right. I didn't think it was the right time, but um, really, all I've feel like I've I've gotten permission to do is just to to make an appeal to tell everybody, hey, if you feel like you're called to support us, um, to just become a basement promoter. You know, um, it's only twenty bucks a month. You know, um, let me also say that I love everybody that has cho has chosen to give, no matter what they give. If you're a press beer, if you are a, um, a dweller, um, if you're a promoter, those that press B give five bucks a month. And for whatever reason why you would come off five dollars every month to give us, that's cool. Uh, for some of you all, you, you've become a dweller and you give 10 bucks a month and we've never asked you to, you've just felt compelled to do it. A lot of you all give in the chat. I give with you in the chat. Only reason why I'm not on the chat because this is alive right now. You know what I mean? So um, all of that's been really cool. Um, uh, but the basement promoter is, is 20 bucks a month. I mean, you want it to tithe and I don't want the tithe to, <laughs> 
to leave the local church. So I want the tithe to stay in the local church. But um, and you might not feel like 20 bucks is a lot of money, but if a thousand people give 20 bucks, it's 20 grand. Right. And um, it's not to say that I need <laughs> 20 grand a month. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just kind of doing simple math. Um, but I'll tell you what, if if uh, if that was the case and a thousand people were given 20 bucks or two thousand people were given 20 bucks or three thousand people were given 20 bucks. It makes my life a lot easier to just sit here and do content. I don't have to go take a preaching engagement. I don't have to. I, I, I still feel called to preach, but I feel as anointed sitting down as I did standing up. I feel mo more anointed here. I feel like this is where I belong. Um, I feel like I'm supposed to support preachers so that they can go preach in the pulpits. And I'm just supposed to help mentor and disciple people in the basement so that they can go be a part of some really good churches um, in the world. And so um, I would just ask y'all to um, pray about giving, you know, whatever you give is fine. Honestly, if you, if you're like, man, I don't have 20. I just, I'll just give the five. That's fine as well. Um, I'm just thinking about scale. And, and so if more people gave 20 bucks, then we would be, we would be set to do whatever we want to do. And um, just so you know, this is a this is a LLC. It's not a non for profit. That's another reason why um, you can't tie to what we're doing um, is because this is this is a for profit entity. We make money. We pay taxes. Um, but I really felt like um, in 2020, the Holy Spirit told me to dissolve my nonprofit. I didn't see any of this coming. So this happened all before this came. But I dissolved the, the nonprofit uh, in January of 21. And, and then I funded a for-profit with $100 in uh, February of 21. And um, the for-profit made like $350,000. And I paid taxes on it, uh, but I was able to bless a lot of people and do a lot of stuff for the kingdom. And I didn't have to like go through a board to get approval. And I, and I, I don't say that like I'm out here rogue, like, yeah, I don't have any oversight. I still, I'm still submitted to authority. I'm still submitted to my pastors. I'm still submitted to my mentors. But I believe that there's moves that we're supposed to make that um, are not tied to church. Um, and I feel like I'm going to be able to help the kingdom and help churches because I'm outside of the church system. Um, the 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 uh, the story and the analogy that keeps coming back to me that I feel like God has ordained for my life in this season that He's called me out of the boat to stand on water to preach to people and to teach people that are in the boats. And I can't tell the truth to whatever boat I'm supposed to speak into if I'm a part of that boat. Cause sometimes when you're in the same boat that you actually need, like if, if I say this to them, then they probably won't give me no money. If I say that to them, they probably won't like me anymore. I'm standing on water with Jesus. I came out here with Jesus to stand on water. He told me to stand on water. And as long as I get my keep my eyes on him, I won't sink. So I'm trying to keep my eyes on Jesus. And um, I would we will do what we're doing based on your support. Like we could have taken, we've we could have tried like to go uh off of this. We tr we could have tried to go off of this platform and get people to do uh what was the what what is it? Patreon, right? And like Patreon takes less of a percentage um, and, you know, you could try to get money that I, I, I trust God. <laughs> I just trust God. <laughs> I trust God, yo. And, and so uh, I'm not having no um, pep rally. I'm not having no like snake oil. I'm not about to go to Israel and tell y'all to like, if you buy this prayer shawl, five hundred dollars then you would learn how to do this and that and the other i'm not gonna charge fifteen hundred dollars for a prayer service um i'm just gonna make an appeal and i and i think i'm i'm i'm, I'm giving you the truth of what this money is going to be used for um uh the more people that support us on a monthly basis um google takes their cut they take 30 percent um uh but that leaves us with enough money to operate buy cameras that we need do what we're doing like we're doing our studio that we have 
Um, I, I just want to be in a position where nobody can tell me what to do except God and the people that have authority in my life. Like, I, <laughs> nobody's going to tell me to stop making this content. I don't care if I piss every church off, right? If, if, I, if I have good ground that scripture says it, I'm not scared of you. I'm not relying on anybody for no preaching engagements. I'm not in nobody's boat. That's why the Lord had me step down. He said, I don't want you in no boat. I want you out on the water with me, and I want you to speak to every boat I tell you to speak into. And I love, I love everybody, but I'm not coming out of this book. Point blank, period. So um, uh, if that resonates with you and you feel like you want to assist, again, keep the tithe in the storehouse. The storehouse is the church. If you don't believe in tithing, I dare you to try it for 30 days and, and come back and holler at your boy. Tithing works, okay? If you think it's Old Testament and it's not a New Testament, then I'll tell you that tithing started before the law and you can go figure that out for yourself. All I know is whatever I make, 10% goes to God. And because of that, my life has been blessed. I'm not going to stop. You can't make me stop. I don't care. If I make $100,000, I got 90. If I make 2 million, I got 1.8. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like ain't nobody going to stop me from tithing. You, mm -mm, that ain't going to happen ever. Um, but if you can support, cool. And um, again, $5, $10, $20 a month. Uh, and we're going to cap, like, we're not going to start no crazy stuff where it's like, oh, now we have a $40 option and now we have an $80 option. And now you get a free pair of Jordans. If you start giving $500 a month, this ain't no telethon fam. And this is not no like tele, huh? See Juliet over there playing again. I'm over here trying to be serious. She was like, so you're not going to offer them miracle water. <laughs> we have filtered water. We do have a filtration system to our house. So we can bottle up some filter water for you, but I can't charge you for it. That's stupid. Um, so uh, I don't know what our plans are. Um, all I know is that God has us, and this this is a special place that he's given us with the basement, and um, I'm here for it. And I don't want, I really don't want to be available for much else. There's a, a few churches that I feel like I'm supposed to help. Um, but I'm stepping down as a preacher so that I can so I can help people live their life. There's enough preachers. I, I love preaching. I'll always love preaching. I'll never stop preaching. Um, but maybe maybe preaching doesn't look like preaching. Maybe preaching looks like talking. And I'm cool with just talking. And so... Um, Anyway, I, I I hope I answered the question. You did, and just for um for clarity for people, we did not plan this segment to look like an emotional ask <laughs> to give. Oh heck no! Please. We would never oh, Jesus, no. do that. And real quick, just the integrity of this man on that microphone, multiple multiple times in privacy, he has said, "Oh, basement's making all this money. Cool." What are we going to do for the basement dwellers? What are we going to do to sew back? Um, and I, I love that we get to be clear with, with our people. Well, listen, yeah, I, I, obviously I didn't know you were going to ask that question. I didn't know I was going to cry. I didn't know, none of that. Um, but what, I, what I'm not going to do is if you don't believe me, don't listen to the pod. If you don't believe what I say, don't listen to the pod. I'm, um, I'm not going to be putting around a lot, like a lot of disclaimers around what I say. I'm just saying what I say. Let my yes be yes and my no be no. Um, I know I'm supposed to provide content in this season. And um, with, with the support that we already have, we're able to do some cool things. If we have more support, we'll be able to do more cool things. And if you're, if you're giving, give until God tells you to stop. And when he tells you to stop, stop giving. <laughs> you know what I mean? So nobody's obligated to do anything. And um, I know this is a, it's, it's a it's a crazy venture because I'm not doing a nonprofit and I'm not setting up like, here's my here's my link to sow into the ministry. I'm paying taxes. But I'm paying tax. I'm rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's because I don't want Caesar censoring me and telling me what I can't do. And nonprofit just has some loopholes 
that sometimes get a little bit sticky and you know, we can't do this because we're a nonprofit. I pay my taxes. I'm going to say what I want. If Elon Musk can say what he wants and Kanye West can say what he wants and Andrew Tate can say what he wants, I'm going to say what I want. And everything I say is going to come from this Bible. And you can't stop me from saying it because I pay my taxes. So that's all I got to say about that. Praise the Lord. Is that it? You feel good? I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> We've been going for two hours and fifty minutes. Fifteen, Lord. Jesus. <laughs> but it's only eleven oh five. Isn't it two hours and five minutes? Didn't we start at nine? Oh, a ten minute countdown. Ah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's it's twelve. It's it's twelve Eastern Standard Time. 12.05. It's uh, 9.05 uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, it's, uh, gosh, let me see. Because uh, I got all the places that I, that I be in, in my, where am I, where am I talking? Um, it is 2.06 in Brisbane. It is 4.06 a.m. It's 2.06 p.m. in Brisbane. It is 2.06 p.m. in Perth, 3.06 in Sydney. Uh, London is 4.06 a.m. Cape Town, South Africa is 6.06 a.m. I don't even know if these people are awake um, at this time. How many people are still in the chat? In the chat still right yeah. now? Yeah. We, have, we have over 1,200 people in the chat, and that's only shy of... 50 people from our max that we reached out. We reached over 1,300 people in the chat tonight. Yes. <laughs> this is a joke, man. This is some kind of practical joke I, that I'm not, I'm not, I don't even know how to deal with. Um, all right. Uh, should we do it again? I think we asked them. All right, chat. Uh, I need y'all to blow up the chat and let us know if we should continue doing live stream episodes, and we'll give you some, we'll give you a briefer. Hey, 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 hey! With the disclaimer, we ain't gonna like start doing lives every Tuesday. <laughs> we we can't be up in my house to eleven o'clock every single chat's Tuesday going night. Going chat's going well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what though, baby? Are you cool? If we do like the month of November, like lives for the month of November, uh huh, for the month of November, you you cool with that? Hey, so so what if what if we what if we do what if we do lives for the whole month of November? Live stream no <gasps> <laughs> live stream November. <laughs> Live stream November. That had a whole, I felt that as soon as you said it. Sammy, bro. Sammy and heck, bro. Yeah, this is a wonder. That's Bezalel and Aholiab right there, bro. Those are my people. Bezalel and Aholiab. All right, so is it official? It is an agreement, like it. and we can't go back from it because these dwellers will catch <laughs> us in these streets. Yeah, we cannot be caught lacking, right? Hold on. Let me, let me make sure all of my Tuesdays. Eighth. While you were asking Juliet, the chat was saying, Juliet, please say yes. Please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. That okay, so the eighth, the fifteenth, the twenty second, and there's five. So we got we got five. Five live. Hey. Five live. Five live. All right. So the first, the eighth, the fifteenth, the twenty second, and the twenty ninth. Uh we are doing lives for the whole month and uh oh is Rach, are all are are all the dates good in in November? Oh, the week after Thanksgiving. Oh, the twenty second. Yeah. Is it is it okay? Okay, I I listen. I 
I am sensitive to wives. <laughs> I saw Rachel's face. I was like, we, I ain't about to get, I'm not about to get Hector Ra in trouble uh, with Rachel, Rachel. Rachel had a chancla already just coming out the side. <laughs> don't shake them. Don't shake them. Okay, so we are having, what did you call it? Five Live? Uh, li uh, live stream November. Live stream November. Let's go. All right, man. So we're going to do live streams, um, live pods for the entire month of November, the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. We got four more for this month. And um, we're just here to provide some content and give y'all some love. And I got, I got a better one for you. Okay. Live Ember. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's live ember. <laughs> That's fire. Live ember is fire, Sammy. All right. Listen, I love y'all so much. Um, thank y'all for hanging out with us. Thank y'all for being a part of this. Um, for all of y'all that are already uh, members, um, I love you guys. And and thank you for your support. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm being dead a right like you, you don't have to like bump up to any place you're uncomfortable if you're a press beer i love you being a press beer if you're a basement dweller i love you being a dweller if you are a promoter already you were already uh on that vibe then i love you being a promoter i love you wherever you uh fall in okay so thank you guys so much for supporting thank you for your encouragement it means the world to me words of affirmation is my love language so um, it means the world to me. And um I'm I'm praying for Lizzie. She's just on my heart and um uh thankful for for everybody that that made this a, a good flow tonight. Uh I apologize for chewing in your ear again. Um I couldn't wait. If that was unprofessional, just chalk it up to the fact that I'm a newbie. I've only been doing this for about four months, right? I love you guys so much. Thank you for being a part of the pod. Until next week, live. Get down to the basement. It's safer down here. I love y'all.